All right. Well, welcome uh, back to Library uh, 630, Organizing and Managing Library Collections. Uh, I am recording this in my home, so I may have to pause it uh, if a cat unexpectedly jumps on my lap or the table or a dog barks. So I hope you'll forgive any of that <coughs> sort of thing. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, talk about what this course uh, is going to cover, um, and then we'll get into the, the meat of um, this week's topic. So the course is going to cover the principles and concepts that undergird the management and organization of library resources, uh, the connections between the community served, the curriculum supported, and the collections developed, the role that the collection management policy serves to support the management and organization of library resources, and the processes of acquisitions, uh, cataloging, and uh, classification. This lecture serves as an introduction and to an overview of the principles and concepts that undergird the management and organization of libraries. Um, it's important that the foundational values and purposes of school libraries are understood in order to make decisions that can effectively support those values and purposes. So let's start by discussing what a library collection is. So library, library collections consist of resources available from and through the library. Um, these re resources can be physical or digi digital, and they serve to meet the needs of users of the library. Um, they're not just books. Uh, I know I've heard of libraries that uh, are uh, that people can check out tools, gardening tools, um, woodworking tools, those sorts of things, baking equipment. Uh, there's seed libraries. Um, I have a friend who uses a children's toy library. So there are all kinds of libraries um, around, and they all serve their constituents their constituents and um, their own unique purposes. Uh, collections uh, in typical school libraries um, include not just the physical or digital resources, but they also include the um, ability to access those collections. So we're talking ab about print, um, audiovisual, and digital resources. Uh, we're talking about books, DVDs, CDs, ebooks, websites, uh, periodicals. Some of the equipment that may be used are computers, iPads, microfiche machines, remember microfiche, ebook readers, DVD players, and um, other things that may be in library collections are manipulatives or puppets or globes. Um, I'm sure that you can think of some other things that may be available in school libraries. So all of those resources and the means of accessing them make up the uh, school library collection. So resources are not limited to those that can only be accessed within the walls of the library. So it's not sufficient. Well, there goes the dog, so hold on a second. All right, so it's not sufficient to merely acquire resources. Uh, potential users must be able to find the resource that they're looking for. Um, so meaningful organization helps people find things. Um, so think about how much easier it is to find uh, clothes when all the socks are in one drawer, and pre preferably paired together, or your shirts are hanging next to each other in a closet, and when your shoes are in one closet or one location. Now think about how much more difficult it is to find a pair of socks when you haven't had time to fold the laundry and they're all jumbled together in a laundry basket. Or maybe that's how you actually live. I know sometimes that's how I am. So um, obviously we can tell that in our lives, organization makes things um, easier to access and to find. Um, so the same sort of um, idea applies to library collections. Principles such as co-location, which means um, bringing together things that are uh, similar, and um, in the term in in the um, sense of libraries, um, bringing together works that are works that are by the same author, uh, works that have variant titles, uh, different editions, 
of the same work, different parts of the same series, and uh, works on closely related subjects. These are the sort of things that libraries co-locate. Uh, the other uh, idea that we bring to uh, the organization of materials is the idea of differentiation. So co-location means to bring things together. Differentiation means to distinguish. Uh, so we want to be able to dis distinguish between uh, names, titles, and subject terms that are the same. And there's an example on the screen of the name John Smith, a very common name. And libraries have a way of being able to distinguish one John Smith from the other John Smith so that when you're looking for um, a resource, for instance, by a photographer named John Smith, you don't want to have to wade through all of the resources uh, by an author named John Smith who writes um, action and adventure stories. So those are the ideas that um, uh, fall under that umbrella of organization, co-location, and differentiation. A library, a library named um, S.R. Reagan Nathan was considered the father of library science, and he developed five laws that define all of a library's functions and responsibilities. Boiled them down to five different laws. Dr. Ranganathan uh, died in 1972, well before the digital age, so the language that he uses in his laws is just a little bit outdated, uh, but the principles behind the laws are still useful for guiding decisions that school library media specialists must make. For the purposes of this course, um, I'm going to explain those laws in, in regard to collections and the organization of those collections. So the first law is that books are for use. And obviously in, in our context today, that would mean resources are for use. It's the role of the librarians to uh, acquire resources and provide access to those resources so that they can be used. Uh, we don't just collect things for the sake of collecting them. And barriers to access should be limit, uh, limited or eliminated altogether. Uh, if you can't get to the resource, then it's not um, very usable. So barriers can be such things as, for instance, the hours of operation of the library. Um, whenever you put a resource behind the desk, even it's, if it's to protect that resource, you're still building a barrier to access that resource. Um, and not having access to a device that can access uh, those resources is a barrier. So there may be some students in your um, school who don't have access to, say, an iPad or a laptop or an ebook reader. And therefore, if you um, provide access to those things, they're not able to read an ebook because they don't have an ebook reader. Uh, Libraries uh, try to m mitigate the, those sorts of barriers by providing the equipment, um, making the equipment available through the library. So um, the first law of library science is that resources are for use. The second law is that every reader his book. So acquisitions of materials is informed by this law as the school library media specialist should keep in mind its users whenever considering resources or materials to acquire. Um, additionally, they should be familiar enough with the resource in order to be able to help the students find and use it, uh, making that connection from, from the user to the resource. It's important that the library media specialist is able to make the connection between the library user and the resource that they need. It's also important to keep in mind the various ways that students and teachers use information or can access that information in order to provide it in a form that's useful. Often we think about what information they might need and forget about how they might use that information. So in terms of students' learning styles, it's important to be able to pro provide resources that can accommodate a variety of learning styles. Or if there are uh, students with disabilities or challenges, there need to be resources or equipment that helps to um, mitigate that challenge. The third law is every book its reader. So this law addresses the need for the library to connect the user to the information that they need. So it was 
sort of mentioned in uh, um, previous law, but this law specifically gets at the idea of making sure that um, you're able to get that information to the reader. Um, providing the equipment and devices, as well as cataloging and classifying material in meaningful and systematic ways, serves to connect users to resources and information. If we have a bunch of resources in our collections, but we don't um, make those resources findable because we don't have very good records in the collection, uh, it or in the in the catalog, um, it sort of. Um, makes it difficult to fulfill this this law of every book its reader. Um, so considering how users might access resources and information outside the, law, the walls of the library is an important aspect of connecting the user to the information they need. The fourth law is to save the time of the reader. Save the time of the user of the information. The way materials are organized, whether physically arranged in the library space or on the library's website, for instance, can help or hinder the ease with which a user can find a resource. I mentioned before that uh, the catalog record and the thoroughness of how of the cataloging that's done or whether or not uh, a record contains good access points, such as subject headings, um, can also serve to expedite or delay a user's access. I'm guessing that you may have had a very frustrating experience trying to use a library's catalog and not really understanding how to uh, go about finding the resource that you want. We know that Google is a quick way of searching for something and you get immediate results and I know that users today are so familiar with that ease of search that they get frustrated with library catalogs. So we want to minimize the frustration and still make um, library catalogs as robust and um, uh, reliable as, as, as they are. Um, we don't want to um, delay a user's access to the information that they need because of those sorts of things. Um, in today's age of information overload, the actions of library media specialists in making collection management decisions as well as organizing the resources is crucial to saving the time of the library user. And finally, the fifth law is that the library is a growing organism. And I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. <clears throat> I like to think about libraries' collections as gardens. So whether you have a vegetable or a flower garden, gardens are in a constant state of change and adjustments. Gardens are never done. There's always something that needs to be done in a garden. The seasons change and plants change with the seasons. And the gardener needs to adjust to that and, and work in the garden because of those changes. Plants die and um, need to be replaced. New plants a gardener may want to add a new flower or a new a different type of vegetable to their garden. Um, so that changes the structure and, we need, and sometimes they may want to remove some plants that are getting overcrowded or taking over a certain space. Um, the size of a garden can expand or contract depending on the needs of the gardener or the ability of the gardener to work that collection. Uh, the gardener can uh, choose to change the type of garden that they want. They may start out with a vegetable garden and end up adding um, some herbs to it to um, sort of uh, change the, the focus of the, of the garden. <clears throat> and then feeding, watering, and weeding uh, must be constantly done in order to have a healthy garden. So the health of either a garden or a library is... Um, it can be equated to its growth and flexibility. Just like gardens, if a collection is stagnant, um, it will die or become of limited use to the community it's supposed to serve. <clears throat> I think that we can um, consider some of the factors that impact library collections. Um, for instance, uh, Kimmel talks about um, uh, the standards that impact um, what types of materials are added to a library. Uh, the formats, uh, we, we have seen, and Kimmel talks about this as well, the shift from um, 
the physical resources in the library to more digital or virtual, virtual uh, resources. Users impact collections and uh, demographic changes in our in our community will impact the sorts of resources that we may want to add or some of the resources that we have that are no longer necessary. The curriculum that we serve with our collections, if that changes, it's going to change, uh, need to have a reciprocal change with our library collections so that they, we can make sure that our collections are supporting the curriculum. Budgets can have a direct impact on collections, um, whether we continue to provide access to a resource that we used to provide access to can be directly affected by a reduction in the budget. Likewise, if we have uh, an increase in funding, we can add more resources to the collection, and space can also um, impact the form and structure of a collection. Although uh, Kimmel doesn't come out and say this in her book, when she talks about standards for library collections, there's, there's an underlying implication in what she says. That Im implication is that a specific library collection is a unique organic entity. Um, in other words, it should not have the same exact resources that any other library has. So uh, we need to think about um, each, each collection being unique and um, that they need to complement and not duplicate other libraries' collections. While there are lots of lists of recommended titles for libraries, there is no list of titles that, set, that defines a good library. Um, each collection should fit in with or complement other collections that may be available in the same community. And each library's collections should be, could be one collection of um, a larger group of collections. For instance, if uh, there are multiple libraries throughout the different um, elementary schools in a district, uh, the one library at, uh, at one elementary school is going to have a different collection than the library at a different elementary school. Um, all because of those other factors that we that we discussed, and they need to complement each other and not just duplicate. And finally, um, each collection will be will be unique because of the mission that that collection serves. What role does the library media specialist play in creating unique, uh, changing library collections? They serve as a mediator or an intermediary in selecting resources, organizing those resources in a meaningful way, and connecting the resources with the user. In order to have a collection that's useful for the community which it serves, management and organization of the library's collection should be guided by the mission of the library which should correspond with and support the mission of the school. A well-developed collection management policy will guide the decisions of the library media specialist in support of the mission. So please make note that there's a typo in the Kimmel text on page seven. Um, she refers to the mission statement from empowering learners as being in appendix E, but it's actually in appendix F. And so that mission statement is really important. Next week, we will be learning more about the important role that the collection development policy plays and the mission statement along with that and why it's so important to have a policy in place. <laughs>